want you to hit me as hard as you can. Director Alejandro Iñárritu's film, The Revenant, is a towering achievement in many regards, from Leonardo DiCaprio's Oscar-winning performance to the stunning direction and cinematography. The documented struggles of making the movie, which include fighting the bitter cold and relying on the very limited sunlight and the filmmaker's quest to utilize only natural light, contribute to the film's overall impressiveness. But perhaps the most remarkable part of The Revenant is that it's based on a true story. Loosely adapted from Michael Punk's book of the same name, The Revenant follows frontiersman Hugh Glass in his pursuit of vengeance against the men who left him for dead following a brutal grizzly bear attack. Punk based his novel on a number of sources like newspaper publications and oral recountings from men who claim to have known Glass. But does the film accurately portray Glass's epic journey? Let's bundle up and find out what the f**k really happened to this movie. The year is 1823. Hugh Glass, played by Leonardo DiCaprio, and his half pawnee son, Hawk, are employed as guides for the Rocky Mountain Fur Company, leading a crew of ruffians through perilous terrain. One day, Glass sets out alone in search of food for the trappers, and it's during this solitary expedition that he's brutally mauled by a mother grizzly bear, leaving him clinging for dear life. He's discovered soon after, and it's determined that he will not survive the night. The leader, Captain Andrew Henry, played by Donald Gleason, doesn't have the heart to simply leave Glass for dead, so he offers $100 to John Fitzgerald, played by Tom Hardy, and teenager Jim Bridger, played by Will Poulter, to stay with Hawk and his injured father. Fitzgerald, however, quickly grows impatient. While Bridger is off retrieving water, Fitzgerald attempts to suffocate Glass. Hawk tries to intervene, but is murdered by Fitzgerald, who hastily buries the body. When Bridger returns, Fitzgerald lies to him about Hawk disappearing, and claims to have seen Arikara natives nearby. Panicked, Bridger helps Fitzgerald bury Glass, alive. They steal Glass's weapons and supplies, leaving him alone and defenseless in the uncompromising wilderness. But what Fitzgerald and Bridger don't anticipate is Glass's slow but miraculous recovery. Before long, he's on the move, beginning his long and arduous quest for vengeance. Although the story at the center of The Revenant is a relatively simple one, there were some major liberties that Inyaritu and writer Mark L. Smith took when plotting out the film. The most substantial was the inclusion of Hugh Glass's half pawnee son, Hawk. In real life, Hugh Glass never had a son. Thus, the primary motivation behind his vengeance was totally fabricated. The reason that the real Hugh Glass went after Fitzgerald and Bridger, outside of being left for dead, was to retrieve his trusty Hawkins rifle that Fitzgerald stole. It isn't the most exciting or sympathetic motivator, which is probably why it was changed. But there is a kernel of truth in Hugh Glass's relationship with the Pawnee natives. In the film, Hugh Glass had a Pawnee wife that was massacred during an attack by the U.S. Army. While there's no evidence to suggest there was ever a massacre, it is true that Hugh Glass had a Pawnee wife, and the story of how that came to be is quite interesting. George C. Yount, a mountain man and adventurer, wrote a series of memoirs in the 1850s. These stories were later discovered and published in the California Historical Society Quarterly in 1923. Among these stories was The Adventures of Hugh Glass, which was recounted to Yount by none other than Glass himself. According to this account, Glass worked as a sailor for several years before his crew was overtaken by French pirate Jean Lafitte. Under threat of death, Glass reluctantly became a member of Lafitte's crew, working under the famed privateer for over a year before gathering up the courage to jump ship, literally. Along with a fellow sailor, Glass escaped his captors and swam to shore, washing up somewhere around Galveston, Texas. From there, the two men moved inland, navigating unfamiliar terrain while also avoiding various tribes of dangerous natives. After trekking hundreds of miles over several months, Glass and his unnamed comrade were captured and imprisoned by the Pawnees, who did not take kindly to these white invaders. According to Yount and author John Myers, Myers, who published the saga of Hugh Glass, the two men were to be ritually sacrificed. Glass watched horrified as his friend was tied to a stake, poked all over with pine needles, and then set ablaze. Glass thought his time was up. But the cunning mountaineer had something up his sleeve. When it was time to meet his maker, Glass presented the Pawnee chief with a handful of vermilion, a substance of great value among the Pawnee people. The chief was so impressed by the gift that Glass's life was spared, and he was inducted into the tribe as an honorary member. For the next two years, Glass lived among the tribe, married a Pawnee woman, learned his way around the land, and even went to war alongside them. In January of 1823, two years after joining the Pawnee tribe, Glass traveled to St. Louis alongside the chief to meet with the U.S. Superintendent of Indian Affairs. When the chief returned to his people, Glass stayed behind in St. Louis for unknown reasons. It was here that he saw an advertisement seeking trappers for the Rocky Mountain Fur Company. 
Glass answered the call, joining Captain William Ashley and Captain Andrew Henry's crew alongside Jim Bridger, John Fitzgerald, and a number of others. Glass joined a contingent of men under Captain Ashley while Captain Henry sailed ahead. The men realized they would need horses if they wanted to effectively set their traps on land, so they approached the typically volatile Arikara natives and proposed a trade. In exchange for a few rifles, the trappers would receive horses. The Arikara agreed to the trade, but it wasn't long before relations soured. That night, two of Ashley's men snuck into the Arikara village and raped two women. The men were immediately captured by the natives and brutally killed. A battle between the two groups erupted the next morning, which left several men dead and Glass injured. This is approximately where the film opens, with Hugh Glass and company escaping the early morning ambush. For the sake of simplicity, a few details were changed. For starters, Captain Ashley, who doesn't appear in the movie despite being present during the actual attack, is replaced by Captain Henry. Second, the men set sail for Fort Kiowa in the film, when in reality their target is Fort Henry. This was likely changed to avoid confusion. While it is true the men were ambushed by the Arikara, the movie alters the motivations behind the attack. In the film, the war party is in search of the chief's abducted daughter, Pawaka. But Pawaka never existed, and in reality, the trappers were attacked because the two men raped the Arikara women. After escaping the war party, the men land ashore. Glass takes the lead, more familiar with the territory than the others. It's worth noting here that there is no written evidence that Glass served as a guide for the trappers in any capacity. While his time with the Pawnee natives probably instilled him with a strong sense of the land, there's nothing explicitly stated in available sources to suggest he was hired because of these traits, as he was in the movie. Later, when the men set up camp, Glass goes off to hunt for food. It is here where he endures the brutal grizzly attack. The film portrays the mauling in vicious and accurate detail. The only real change is in the film, Glass kills the bear on his own, when in reality the bear was killed by the expedition members that found it. As written in George C. Yount's account, the two hunters hastened to his relief and discovered a huge grizzly bear with two cubs. The monster had seized him, torn the flesh from the lower part of his body and from the lower limbs. He also had his neck shockingly torn. An aperture appeared to have been made into the windpipe, and his breath exuded at the side of his neck. Now that is grizzly. Glass obviously survived the attack, but lost his ability to speak and move, which the film also accurately shows. The men built a stretcher and attempted to carry Glass through the mountains, but realized after several days that it was a lost cause. Unable to mercy kill Glass himself, Captain Henry offered $400, which is more than the $100 offered in the film, to anyone willing to stay and provide Glass with a proper burial once he finally succumbs. Fitzgerald and Bridger volunteered for the job as they do in the movie. The only difference is the presence of Hawk, Glass's fictionalized son. When Fitzgerald grows impatient and decides to put Glass out of his misery, Hawk intervenes and is killed. In reality, Fitzgerald and Bridger cared for Glass as best they could. By all accounts, they seemed much more hospitable than they appear in the movie. But after several days and no improvement, the two men mutually decide to leave. Together, they drag Glass over to a berry bush near a creek and take his knife, kettle, and rifle, and set off to Fort Henry, leaving him to his fate. Determining the accuracy of the events from this point forward gets tricky, as there is no clear timeline established in the film. How long does it take for Glass to recover enough to walk? How many days or weeks or months does it take for him to make it to the fort? How far away is the fort? None of it is very clear, but it appears the filmmakers condensed Glass's journey quite significantly. In the movie, Glass steadily begins his recovery after what appears to be a couple of days, eating berries and drinking from the creek. He even cauterizes his neck wound using gunpowder. With the exception of the self-cauterization, which doesn't appear to have actually happened, this is all fairly accurate. Glass eventually gains enough energy to leave his would-be burial site, narrowly escaping the Arikara who stumble upon the area in search of Powaka. But again, Hawk and Powaka never existed, and this scene is totally fabricated. Glass spends the next few days crawling through the snowy terrain, slowly regaining his ability to walk. During all this, we cut back and forth to Fitzgerald and Bridger as they make their way to the fort. Bridger realizes Fitzgerald lied to him about the Arikara and tries killing him, which doesn't exactly go as planned. All to be gone. <laughs> the two men continue on foot for days before reaching the fort, where Fitzgerald tells Bridger to lie about what they had done. Fearing for his life, Bridger agrees. They inform Captain Henry of Glass's death and accept the reward, though it is clear that Bridger is not pleased about it. In reality, there was a lot less drama between the two men. They regroup with Captain Henry a few days later, hand in Glass's supplies as proof of his demise, and accept their cash reward. There was no attempted murder, or talks of God being a squirrel. Yeah. Big old meaty one. As a matter of fact, pretty much the entire relationship between Bridger and Fitzgerald was created for the movie. Eventually, the Arikara that had been trailing Glass catch up to him. He's aware of their presence first, and thus he's able to narrowly escape certain death by jumping into the freezing river. He lets the current carry him downstream, 
enduring rapids and frigid waters before eventually washing ashore. While Glass had many close encounters with Arikara during his actual journey, and other native tribes for that matter, there aren't any accounts of him having to escape in treacherous rivers. Most of Glass's actual journey took place during the summer and autumn months, so the movie's brutal winter environment can be chalked up to Hollywood invention. Glass stumbles upon a large herd of buffalo being attacked by wolves. One unfortunate beast becomes dinner for the pack. Glass soon passes out, only to wake and find the wolves set ablaze by a lone Native American who we learn is an ex-Pawnee named Hickok. Glass shows he means no harm and begs for food, and Hickok tosses him the animal's liver out of sympathy. Fun fact, DiCaprio, a well-known vegetarian, actually ate real raw bison liver for the scene. Talk about commitment. But the reality of this sequence is actually crazier than the film, if the written accounts can be trusted. Glass was the one who fends off the wolves with fire. He waited for them to fill their bellies and then chased them off himself, despite his weakened state. He then feasted on the meat and rested for several days, further revitalizing him. In the film, Hikuk takes the injured Glass under his wing for a brief period, helping him eat and building shelter and tending to his rotting wounds. While this brief partnership elicits some powerful moments in the film, Hikuk was another Hollywood fabrication. In reality, Glass slowly recuperated on his own over the course of several months. Glass wakes up alone and trudges forward, only to soon discover his savior hanging from a tree. He moves ahead, finding a group of French trappers who appeared earlier in the movie, making a trade with the Arikara chief. It's here that he spots Poaka, presently being abused by one of the trappers. He sneaks up and holds a gun to the abuser's head, careful not to alert the others. Poaka slips from the rapist's grasp, takes his knife, and castrates him. All hell breaks loose, and Glass steals a horse and flees the scene, leaving Poaka and his trusty water canteen behind. As mentioned earlier, Poaka and the subplot surrounding her kidnapping was a Hollywood creation, so this entire sequence never really happened. Furthermore, the following scene, where a sleeping glass is awakened by attacking Arikara and is chased off a cliff, also never happened. Nor did he gut a horse and burrow inside its carcass for warmth. All of that was invented for the movie. The next day, one of the French fur trappers, having survived an attack by the Arikara war party, stumbles into the fort with Glass's canteen in tow. He presents it to Captain Henry and company and explains what happened. Since they believe Glass is dead and his son missing, Captain Henry thinks the canteen is Hawk's, so he assembles a search party to find him. He's surprised that they find Glass, not Hawk, stumbling around in the darkness later that night. Angered by the turn of events, Captain Henry rides back to the fort, while the rest of the party stay behind with Glass. He confronts Bridger and threatens him with death by hanging. Bridger begs for his life and is genuinely apologetic, thinking that Glass was legitimately going to die. Henry looks for Fitzgerald, but learns that he left. Not only that, but the fort's safe was broken into and its cash stolen. Glass arrives back to the fort with the others and is welcomed like a walking ghost. While his wounds are treated, he tells Henry that Bridger was coaxed into leaving by Fitzgerald, and that his life should be spared. He asks where Fitzgerald is, and Henry states that he ran off, hoping to make his way to Texas to enlist in the army. Henry plans to track him down the next day, and Glass demands to come along. And so the following morning, the two set off in search of the murderous, thieving Fitzgerald. They discover his tracks and split up. Unfortunately for Henry, Fitzgerald finds him first and kills him. Glass races to the sound of the gunshot and finds Henry's body and horse. There's no sign of Fitzgerald, but Glass has a plan. Fitzgerald reaches a distant ridge and spots Glass with Henry's body and horse. Fitzgerald fires, only to find that he actually shot Henry's corpse in an elaborate trick. Glass jumps up from under the blanket saddled over Henry's horse and fires at Fitzgerald, injuring but not killing him. This begins a foot chase which culminates in a bloody brawl by a brook. Both men are stabbed and beaten. Fitzgerald even loses a few fingers. Glass ultimately gets the upper hand and stabs Fitzgerald. After he does, Glass looks up to find the Arikara war party watching. He sends Fitzgerald's body downstream to the chief, where he's promptly finished off. The war party approaches Glass, and we see the chief is reunited with Powaka. As a sign of gratitude, they spare Glass's life. He stares into the camera, exhausted, but successful in his quest for vengeance. While that's a satisfying ending for a movie, the reality is much more complicated and less satisfying. For starters, it takes almost a full year before Glass is reunited with Captain Henry and his old party of trappers. According to the website hughglass.org, the timeline went something like this. After traveling alone for three months and over 300 miles, Glass arrived at Fort Kiowa to find that his trapping party was instead at Fort Henry. The French fur trappers stationed at the fort were about to set off on a trade mission with the friendlier Mandan Indians. Glass joined them as they would be passing through Fort Henry along the way. Halfway through the journey, however, the trading party was attacked by the Arikara, who were enemies to the Mandan. All the trappers were murdered in the ambush, with the sole exception of Glass. Once more, he set off on a month-long solitary quest to the nearby Fort Tilton, arriving around mid-November, now approximately four months after the initial grizzly attack. 
He rested for a couple of days before continuing to Fort Henry and arrived a month later, only to discover it abandoned. He learned that a new Fort Henry was established at the mouth of the Little Bighorn River, over 150 miles away. Talk about not catching a break. But Glass was nothing if not tenacious. He continued downriver and eventually made his way to the newly minted Fort Henry in January of the following year. It's here where he confronted Bridger and met up with the rest of his old crew. Much like the movie, the real Glass forgave Bridger for what he had done due to his young age. But unfortunately for Glass, Fitzgerald was not there. A few months earlier, he had left for Fort Atkinson, where he planned on enlisting in the army. This is similar to Fitzgerald's plans in the movie, although the real Fitzgerald did not rob Captain Henry of all his cash. With the intense winter hitting its full stride, Glass decided to stay at Fort Henry until March. Over this period, he shared his tales with the men and healed properly to prepare for the journey ahead. It was during this time that his legend truly started to grow. When the early spring months rolled in, Glass set off, still undeterred in his vendetta. He joined another party of trappers and traveled across the dangerous terrain. Along the way, his crew was once again attacked by an Arikara war party, and once again Glass narrowly escaped and continued on his mission like some Old West Terminator. In June of 1824, Glass finally reached Fort Atkinson, a whole four months after leaving Fort Henry. He confronted Fitzgerald, but learned that he successfully joined the army, so killing him would be a federal crime punishable by death. Glass told his story to Fitzgerald's commander, who was sympathetic and returned his stolen Hawkins rifle, but Glass was still threatened with hanging if he tried to kill Fitzgerald. Sadly, all Glass could do was accept his beloved rifle and move on. So, unlike the movie, the real Glass did not get his vengeance. He didn't kill Fitzgerald, or even punch him in the face. He spent a year traveling through hell and back, and in the end it was all for nothing. Well, except a rifle. Kind of anticlimactic. So there's the story behind The Revenant. It is worth noting that many of these accounts were based on stories shared among trappers and journalists, with the originator of these tales in many cases being Glass himself. So it is very possible that the quote-unquote true story of Glass is also rife with exaggerations and potential falsehoods. But since there's no way to fact-check these accounts, we can only take them at face value. Nevertheless, it is clear the movie diverges from the actual tale in a number of significant ways. Although these changes make the film narratively powerful and more cinematic, it is safe to say that The Revenant is more fiction than fact. Thank you for watching. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow Videos channel, tell your friends who like this sort of content, and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all our latest videos. We are an independent company, and we appreciate your support.